Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luan has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Today, Monique Duarte joins me. Monique is the founder and principal of Duarte Decor, and Monique is also the founder of Duarte Consulting, where she coaches interior designers to help run their businesses better. Monique has traveled the world gathering design inspiration and ideas that she brings to her work, and we talk a little bit about that today. Monique is an active member of the National Association of Professional Women of the International Interior Design Association. And she is also a member of the Certified Interior Decorator Association. Monique holds several degrees, including a career degree in interior de- decorating and AutoCAD design, a bachelor's in international business with a specialization in economics and marketing, and a master's degree in interactive and direct marketing. Monique was awarded Woman of the Year for Interior Decorating in New Jersey in 2013 by the NAPW. In addition, her work has been featured in Your Decorating Resource and Moxie Magazine. As an interior design business coach, Monique combines over 10 years of marketing experience with her design knowledge. She has five years experience in running her own profitable seven-figure interior design business, which in her first year, while she was still working in her full-time job, she she managed to have her interior design firm reach six figures. So in a minute, we're going to talk about how she achieved all that. So hang on while I tell you a little bit about our sponsor, and I'll be right back to introduce you to Monique. My great thanks to MyDoma Studio, our podcast sponsor. What is MyDoma Studio? Well, you know, as busy interior designers, that running your own design firm isn't just about designing. That's what we talk about here all the time, right? There's managing contracts, clients, payments, products, and a million other things that you have to have locked down. It is challenging, but you must run your firm efficiently so you can do the fun, creative things you enjoy so much. And that's where My Doma Studio comes in. I'd like to invite you to try My Doma Studio today. Go to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business. Designers around the world are using My Doma Studio. What about you? Let My Doma Studio help you organize the business side and spend more time on the designing side of your firm. I'd also like to share with you that Vin, Bill, and myself are so impressed with My Doma Studio that we have invested in this company. So see for yourself what My Doma Studio can do for your interior design business. And if you visit using the link mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business, you will receive a special offer just for you as listeners of the podcast. Hi, Monique. Thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so this is a special treat, another Jersey girl. Yes. (laughs) So I actually realized you live in New Jersey, but I didn't ask you, are you from New Jersey? No, I'm not. So you're a fake Jersey girl. All right. (laughs) Where are you from? I've been here long enough, so (laughs) I claim it now. Um, I'm actually, it's interesting because I'm a military child, so I've been all over. I've been fortunate um, to travel and, you know, just live all over the world, but um, I grew up in Virginia. That's where uh, I spend most of my time. Okay. So how long are you in Jersey now? Gosh, it's been over 12 years. Okay. So- well, gets in your blood. I'm just yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's oh. awesome. That's awesome. That's cool. All right. So Monique, we have a lot to talk with you about today. You, um, we're going to do, I'm going to tell everybody right out, we're going to do a two part interview because you are a practicing interior decorator in New Jersey. And you also have just recently in the last two months launched a consulting business that helps interior decorators and designers run their businesses more profitably. So we're going to talk about both of these things, but the thing about it is, is that 
you know, you have, you know, I said it in the introduction, so everybody knows that you have the um, degrees in business and economics and then in interactive and, and marketing, direct interactive and direct marketing. So obviously 10 years in advertising and marketing probably really has informed the things that you do to run your own business profitably. Would you talk to me a little bit about that, Monique? And, you know, first of all, you come to interior design because it's really what you, your passion is, right? Right, right. And so you leave the marketing world, the advertising world to open up your own firm, but you have to have taken like a ton of insights and lessons from that career experience and that education experience into helping your business be profitable probably from the get-go, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely been a journey. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, I, I had this dream when I went to college, I actually went to, got my bachelor's, um, from the European School of Economics in London, England. So I left home at the age of 17. You know, I was a military child and I was just ready to travel. <laughs> <laughs> and I got really lucky. You know, I did really well in school um, and I got a full scholarship to mm. my university. And so my mother packed my bags and we were on a plane and we were on our way to Europe. And nice. I um, I spent four years there doing my my bachelor's and you know, after that, I, my dream was to go to NYU. And so NYU in New York city. And so once I finished my bachelor's, I quickly, you know, moved to New York and I had family here in New Jersey. And so that's where my career started in advertising. And, um, I, uh, you know, finished my master's at NYU and that was a great experience. And then I jumped right in, you know, to the industry. Uh, one of my first jobs that, I absolutely loved was I worked for Yahoo for many years, um, running and managing and helping um, big brands that we know and love and use every day, um, basically, you know, launch their products and market their products and their businesses. And I loved it. Like, I remember I would use, I used to tell people that they're going to have to like pull me out of there, kicking and screaming (laughs) before I would ever leave. Um, Because it was it was, you know, the other side of my brain that I was able to use, which is like the strategic planning part of it. Um, And I just love that. I loved solving problems. I loved, you know, trying to find solutions to, you know, issues or problems that, you know, big brands had and and being able to bring their product to the marketplace. So, you know, I did that and I loved it. However, you know, after I want to say probably about after about eight or nine years in the industry, um, I just, you know, I started looking for more. I felt like, you know, I was working a lot. And although I was making six figures, I was making really good money. Um, you know, I was young. I was in my, you know, late, early, mid-20s up into my my early 30s. And, um, you know, I was making really great money. But it just, you ever feel like, you know, you just want more. Like you just, I felt like there was, there had to be more out there for mm-hmm. me. And ironically, I come from a very creative family. My grandmother was an interior designer, um, as well as my mother is an artist. She's a fiber artist and a quilter. So it's interesting because I always say that I got the I got the gift or the neck. I got it a little late. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess they say better late than never because, you know, I started thinking about what else could I do? You know, I knew that if if I stayed in advertising and marketing, for, you know, the rest of my career that, yeah, I would have a lot of experience and, you know, would have made a lot of great money, but I probably would have never done the thing that I was really passionate about and what I felt like I was brought, you know, on the earth to do. So I did a little soul searching and I started, you know, thinking, okay, what do I really enjoy doing? And the only thing that I could really think of was the experience that I had when I had bought my first home. I had bought my first home um, right. Probably I want to say like my, my junior year, um, during my master's degree. And, um, it was such a big accomplishment and it was like all bare walls. It was like white walls. It was no frills. Like it was just a box. Mm. (laughs) And, you know, at the time I was like, okay, I need to, you know, buy a house. I didn't have any children. I wasn't married. And so the tax, you know, the government was taxing me. (laughs) Yes. Right. Right. (laughs) So I bought this house and um, I decorated it from the top, you know, from top to bottom. 
And when I had my housewarming, I remember I had family come, you know, from all over and they, they kept, everyone asked me, who did you hire to design your home? Isn't that something? And, you know, it was like a, a light bulb went off for me because I was like, nobody, it was like, you right. know, I did it myself. And so that's when I knew that I had a gift and um, that it was something that I could, you know, that I should pursue. And so that's what I did. I, you know, while I was working um, still full-time in advertising, I started to build my business slowly on the side and, you know, put together my business, you know, build processes and um, also use the, the experience that, that I got from, you know, that I was, you know, from working in advertising. And I, I put all of that into my business. And it was a very interesting time because at the time that I was transitioning, you know, that's when social media was just booming. And you, you, you know, you, you were seeing small businesses be able to play on the same playing field as large multi-billion dollar corporations because of this wonderful thing called social media and the internet and digital marketing. So, you know, that was the space that I had worked in, digital marketing. So, you know, a lot of companies were shifting their budgets from traditional marketing, which is, you know, like newspapers and, you know, billboards and, you know, TV and print and putting all of their budget into digital marketing. And so, you know, I look back today and to, to just answer your question, you know, it, I feel like I've had a really great opportunity to be able to use that experience and put it into my business because now today, as you know, you know, we play in a very different world. You know, consumers are on their phone, their their mobile phone, they're on their computer, they're on their laptops, their iPads. And, you know, you have to really think about your business in a multidimensional way and how you can reach your, you know, your consume your customers, how you can reach your audience. Um, through different channels. And so I was really lucky to be able to use that experience and put it into my business. And um, it's helped tremendously. And um, it's something that I really love, you know, because I did it for so long. Um, and I think that um, it's a great opportunity for interior designers because now we don't have the challenges of, you know, having a small business and not having a marketing budget where you can grow your business and you can, you know, advertise it. Um, it's very simple to, to be able to play on the same playing field as some of the big boys. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been a, it's been a great experience in, in, in being able to use my skills for, for building my business. Yeah. So the thing is, take me back to starting this business as a side hustle. So mm -hmm. we're going back, what, about eight years? It's since? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's about eight years and you come, you're still actively working in the advertising marketing. As you mm -hmm. said, your, your, your playing field there is digital marketing. So one of the things that you understand, it sounds like to me right off the bat is that it's not necessary for you to open this business on the side with a advertising budget of 10, 20, 30, $40,000, or even $2,000. You're like, okay, I'm going to utilize this free platform of social media and jumpstart this business. Is that, is, am I, am I understanding it correctly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so talk to somebody out there who is literally like, this is it. The, the line in the sand today is the day I start my side hustle. Right. What are the things, what are we going to say that, what did you do those first couple of whatever in order to figure out? I mean, I, cause I'm going to tell you one of the questions I get all the time is what do I share if I don't already have a portfolio? Right. So what, what did you do, Monique? Right. That's a great question. And you know, when I look back, um, I always say that for me, it was important to have a plan, you know, even if it was, like you said, not a, a large marketing budget, I just needed to have a plan. And so I didn't have a lot of money. You know, obviously I was, you know, working still and still had expenses and bills to pay. Um, and I was building this business. And so, you know, I had to put a plan together, figure out, okay, what can I, you know, put towards my business every month? to invest in it, to help grow it. And the first thing that I knew that I needed to do was 
you know, let people know that I have a business, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> Step <laughs> one, <laughs> shingle out. <laughs> so, you know, and I didn't, obviously, you know, I didn't have any projects. So what I did was I actually went to my best friend and I said, listen, I'm starting this business and, um, you know, I need, I need, I need you to help me <laughs> and let me help you in the same time. I said, I'll decorate your house for free. And I remember she had just bought her house and um, she said, okay, that's great. And I said, you know, I I want to, I want to practice this. So the same way that I would work with a client. And so I said, you know, show me some pictures, send me scrapbook, you know, images of things that you like. Um, And she did that. And, you know, I reviewed her, her, you know, her, her, uh, her room, her, you know, her different rooms. We did the living room and the bedroom and, uh, Uh, I went down there. She was actually in North Carolina and I decorated her home. And I remember the picture that she had showed me in the magazine and the pictures that we took afterwards were literally almost identical Mm. because she had said, this is what I want my bedroom to look like. This is what I want my living room to look like. Um, So, you know, I took that project and that was my first project. And I started showing it to people. <laughs> now, did you did you take professional photographs of that project, Monique, or did you just take iPhone photographs? How, what did you do specifically? Uh, I took I took iPhone um, photos, so okay. you know I took my time and did it. But what I did was, you know, um, I created almost like a portfolio. So I remember I did like a video to just try and make it a little bit more interactive. Um, and you know, I just started, you know, telling people that I was in business. And so from that one project, I got my first official project, um, probably about, I want to say maybe six months later. And I got that project simply through building a really great website, um, showing, you know, sharing my, my services and kind of how I work. Um, and then I got this, I, it was through networking with a, a young lady, um, at my church, that um, I went to church with and we were talking and she's like, what do you do? And I said, you know, I'm, you know, working advertising, but I'm, I'm starting, you know, this business. Um, And she said, oh, you know, I need my home decorated. You know, I've been wanting to do decorate it for years. And so that was my official first project. Okay. And that one I did right. So I, you know, I, I remember I, I hired a photographer um, and I I paid him about 700. It was $750. And I remember at the time I was like, man, this is a lot of money. That's the truth, right? (laughs) You're like, am I out of my mind? (laughs) One of the things. But it's worth it. Yeah. And one of the things that my mentor uh, told me, and uh, I got a mentor when I started out because I was green to the industry. He said, you know, you have to take professional photos of your Mm -hmm. work because your work is your brand, you know. You're calling we in a very visual industry. So, you know, I listened to that and I spent the money and I invested it and I looked at it as an investment. Right. right. So the first thing is you got to, you know, you have to, you know, just start somewhere, you know, put your framework together of your business, have a plan and then get at least one project under your belt. That's well for talk, you know, that, that, that you take well, um, really good um, photos of. And then that way you can start your portfolio. Let me ask you a question in there, though. So the first project with the friend in, in North Carolina, when you said that you were taking pictures with the iPhone and so, and so forth, were did you do which way did you do it? Did you simply when it was done? share on your website and your social media befores and afters or XYZs, or did you throughout the process start to feed it to social media? Here's a project I'm working on here. You know, this is how we're attacking this problem and document it in social media in the process. Which did you do? I did it afterwards. Okay. Um, So you put it together. You took the pictures along the way, but mm -hmm. then put it together as, did you put it together as a story, as a project, as a process? I did. I I put it together as like before and afters. And what was really important for me to to tell the story. And I like how you use that word because I feel like that's, that's what we do, right? You Mm -hmm. know, we create transformation. And so I told the story of, you know, this was the look that she was going for, you know, um, you know, we, we, you know, collaborated on the project, you know, I listened to what she wanted and this was the before and this was the after. Okay. So I created that, that, that story. I like that in there because I've had a lot of people express what you just said in there is 
when you're sharing in social media, share it in a way and use language that relays your process. This right. is how we did this. This is what she was looking for. This is the, you know, feeling that she, and this is how I got to that. Because mm-hmm. instead of just like blop, there it is. It's share right. the process. Okay. So, so that was one thing. So I wanted to understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing I wanted to know is you said that you got a mentor in the interior design field when you started the business. Where yeah. did you get the mentor? On Facebook, actually. So tell us that process mm-hmm. because somebody out there is going, I need one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I knew that if I got the information that I needed, that I could be successful. And so I literally went on Facebook and I started following people who I thought, in my opinion, you know, were doing really well in the industry. And I also looked for someone who was in my local area because I know, you know, I knew that I needed to have someone that you know, I could reach out to when I have questions or, okay. you know, when things, when I have, you know, need someone to, to help me with advice. So I reached out, I started looking, okay, I, you know, did a search and I reached out to, um, a gentleman by the name of Nile Johnson. And, um, we're still like, he's still a mentor to me today. And we, we talk and we stay in communication, but I reached out to him and I sent him a note on Facebook <laughs> through messenger. And I said, Hey, I said, you know, I introduced myself. I said, you know, I'm an emerging decorator and um, I'm really green. I don't know much about this industry, um, but it's a passion of mine. And I just want to know if you'd be open and be willing to, you know, just spare a little bit of your time if I have questions or, you know, be a mentor to me. And he was like, absolutely, no problem, whatever you need. Here's my contact information. Um, He actually took me to High Point Market. And showed me how to work High Point Market and how to attend it and, you know, maximize my stay. Um, It was just such a great experience. And I I recommend that any designer who's starting out get a mentor or get a coach because it will save you so much time. Mm. Right. It's (laughs) the truth. It's just like anything else. You don't do it. You don't. There's not a lot of things that you if you wanted to learn how to bowl for crying out loud, you wouldn't just pick up a bowl and throw it down the alley. Exactly. you'd have somebody teach you how to do it. You know what I mean? But I don't know why everybody thinks you go into business and just do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at an athlete, you know, they have coaches, they right. have the best of the best. And it's not because they're not equipped right. to be a good athlete. It's just because, you know, someone's done it already. And yeah, they're going to cut through the weeds for you so you don't have to, you know, invent all the problems and invent all the solutions and half of them are already out there. So I want to ask you a couple more questions about the mentor. Sure. So... You reach out on Facebook, you ask him if he would possibly be interested in sharing some of his time and expertise with you. What, what happened next? I mean, he says yes, but what happens next? Do you then ask him a question a week, a month, a day, like what level and how did you, because to go from stranger and saying, um, you know, can you help me? I don't know too many of us that would say no, but I can imagine there's be many of us that would say, oh, heck, how long, what is this going to involve? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, look, we're, you, you, everybody's running businesses too. So, right. so then there is a, a point where there's a dance where you build a relationship and you're not too much infringing on this stranger mentor, but cultivating a relationship enough that they don't feel overwhelmed and they're still feeling charitable and interested in helping you. And then it probably eventually gets to a point where it's a complete give and take and there's no weirdness there. But I mean, I'm just saying this is real stuff. So how how did you cultivate it so that let's be in plain English, that you were not a pain in the booty to this man? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Right. No, that's a great point. And you know, that was one of the things that I asked him up front. I said, you know, um, you know, how, how comfortable are you, or are you with, you know, how often, you know, is it okay if I call you? And so you know, smart. Yeah. You just asked him what Let his parameters ask- were. I right. love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> love it. Call me. If I'm available, I'll pick up the phone. <laughs> and, okay. So you, know, you literally just, just like said, that. what are you comfortable with? Are you comfortable with a phone call? Are you comfortable with an email message? Did you ask how often, or you just said how, you know yeah. what I mean? I say, you know, how often can I call you? <laughs> I love it. How late can I call you? <laughs> and he said, listen, he's like, 
just call me whenever you need anything. You know, if I'm available, I will definitely be there for you and pick up. Um, he said, there's no limit. You know, I'm, I'm here to support you. And that is really, really that's, great. I have to say, that's, that's so amazing on both sides of that coin. The fact that you were smart enough and brilliant enough to just say, what are the parameters? And, you know, that's where you don't cross any unknown line that you have no idea you're crossing. And right. the fact that he just was like open book and said, whatever you need, call me. That's very generous. That's pretty awesome. Because, yeah. you know, there could be crazy people out there that could be calling him 10 times a day. And he'd be right. like, oh, <laughs> good Lord, why did I say that? <laughs> and so so then let's how long how often did it actually um, usually pan out to be how often did you require and, and need a little help or a phone call? Was it once a week, once a month? How did that develop? Yeah, I think it was probably like a couple of times a week because at the time I was actually um, working on, I was doing my interior decorating degree. So, okay. you know, I had questions and I was also building my clientele. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So you, you were know, learning and doing, and doing at the same time. So sometimes you needed to cut through to like what they're going to do in chapter 10 because you're doing exactly. it today with the client. <laughs> exactly. So I remember like having a, 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 a consultation with the client. It was like my first consult. And I was like, okay, I don't even know what to ask. Like, and I called him and I said, what questions do I ask? <laughs> you know, so things like that, I would call him and he would walk me through, you know, okay, this is the best practice. This is the way to do it. Isn't that something? That really is really, I'm really, uh, that's really, really, what a gift. What a gift that you Absolutely. received, truly. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, you have to find someone who obviously has the time and who's willing to, you know, support you. Um, but one of the things that he said to me, and I live by it today, is that there's enough to go around for all mm. of us. Yeah. And so I was, you know, I feel like I was lucky to get someone who has that perspective because to your point, you know, someone who, who, you know, doesn't have a lot of time or, you know, doesn't have that perspective you know, it could be challenging to have a mentor like that. But mm -hmm. he was, you know, he didn't look at me as his competitor. He looked at me as someone who he could pay forward to mm -hmm. the, the success he's had. Um, and that, you know, it wasn't going to take away from his business. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. It was just really going to help, um, help, you know, help me and help our industry. Because I believe that when we're all practicing um, and at a, at a level of excellence that our industry is better. Mm. Right? And there's enough to go around. Like our industry is an 18 billion dollar industry. I've done the research. So yes. <laughs> that's a lot of money for that's, all of us to go. Around. It's a pretty nice pie to divvy up there. <laughs> no, I agree with you 100%, Monique, because the reality is is that first of all, you're at two different stages of your career, okay? okay. Secondly, you're let's just go here. You're a, a marketing advertising professional you know darn well that your target client is different than his whether you are the exact same stage in your career or not your personality is different your whole approach is different and and that's the thing that is really at the heart of a designer who is feeling overprotective and overly cautious about sharing for fear of competition it the heart of that is not understanding that that could be one prospective client in the room and she's probably only going to ultimately gravitate to one or the other of the two of the designers having nothing to do with if she had, you know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like if you only gave her one choice or not, if she only gave her the choice of you, she still might not pick you if there's no other choice because she, you don't speak to her. You don't, you don't, she, you don't resonate with her. Right. Yep. That's right. And, and the thing is we always talk about, you want the ones that want you that yeah, speak. you want to work with people who you want to work with and who want to work with you right. i mean i've been there it's a nightmare Ugh, working yeah. with a client that when it's not the right fit right it, it, it's not good for anybody so you're absolutely right yeah so i so i love that i love that was unexpected little um road that we went down that whole mentorship thing i didn't know about that before we started talking and i think that's really awesome it's one of my big things i've always said that new businesses if you cannot afford a coach that you must please find yourself a mentor yeah. so my husband had a mentor my husband was my mentor you know what i mean it just really the number of times in the first 10 years in business that i literally just looked up at my desk and said how do do we 
X, Y, Z? Or how right. do, you know, what do we do when? You know what I mean? And it's just like you said, you pick up the phone in the beginning three times a week because that's how, that's how often you need to know something. Right. Right. <laughs> so, right. and we came up without Google, so I couldn't just Google it. Right, <laughs> right exactly. You know, I had to find a living body to answer the question. Right. Probably better. Anyway. Right? It's like going to WebMD and you're, you're, you have a pain somewhere and you're like, what? That's what right. I have? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So, so okay. So, obviously, so now you get your first project. You build into the project, the budget to photograph it. And I'm curious, over the years, have you, well, over the first year, let's say that, over the first year, was there a, there must have been a significant difference, I'm guessing, in the quality of the project and the quality of the photographs. And as a marketing person, did you remove those earlier projects as better and more successful projects came along from your web presence and, you know, start to just keep refining and putting best foot forward? What, what did you do with that? Yeah, I mean, the first project that I took pictures with my iPhone, of my yeah. best friend's house, was the last project that I ever did that with. Okay. So when I started my business, you know, I was very um, specific and intentional that I was always going to work at a level of excellence. Okay. Like I didn't think that, oh, because I'm an emerging designer, I'm just starting that, oh, I have to, you know. Good enough is to, good enough. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I could, I, I, I believed, you know, that I could play at the same playing field. Right. Mm -hmm. I just had to get the experience. So, um, yeah, my first project, like I said, I paid a photographer seven hundred and fifty dollars right, right. to do it because I knew how important that was. So, um, you know, I just I just kept that going and, you know, started doing more projects. And I used that project, you know, the photos and the the you know, the the project from that um from that experience to get more clients and showcase my work. And then it just was like a snowball effect. Right, I right. Just kept going. So tell me about on your website, you have under services, it says local experience and global experience. It's two mm -hmm. different options. Mm -hmm. Is this for marketing purposes? Tell me the difference in, you know, between yeah. the two experiences. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, you said something earlier about, you know, when you were asking, you know, what was, what was the thing that I did to start my business, mm -hmm. the process. Um, the first obviously was, you know, getting at least one project under my belt. The second thing was I had to really get clear on who my client was. And you mentioned this, and I think it's so important because, you know, as designers, we're all different. We all have something unique to bring to the table. It's different. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I said, okay, who do I want to work with? You know, I, tr I, I basically built almost, if you will, a profile of the person, right? that I wanted to, I wanted my client to be. And so I knew that, you know, with, you know, my background, my mother's from the Caribbean island. She's from the islands of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and me being a military child and, you know, traveling, um, throughout my, my entire life is from a, a, a baby Yes, <laughs> that, um, I had something unique to bring to the table. And that was that, you know, I really understood cultures because I've been pretty much almost not everywhere, but I've been a lot of places. And, you know, I love, um, you know, talking with people and meeting people from different places all over the world. And so I knew that that was different because I had I had experienced a different lens that I think than other people have. Mm -hmm. So when I started thinking about who my ideal client was, I said, you know, I'd love to work with people who are local. So local in my area, um, in my state. But I'd also love to work with clients globally, you know, clients all in the Caribbean in Europe and other places. And so that's how I built. And that's what the local experience and the global experience um, stands for. And then we also offer e-design. So that's anyone who, you know, wants to, you know, transform their space and maybe they don't have a lot of time and they don't want to invest um, a large amount of money into their project, but they definitely want to transform a space or two. Um, E-design is great for that person because it's a very um, seamless process. It's all done online and literally they get to hire me as their decorator and, um, you know, we turn their, their home around very quickly. So um, that's, that's the kind of the breakdown, the local experience for the client who's local to me and they get the full service experience where, 
you know, we do the consultation, we handle all of the sourcing and the ordering of their furniture. And then we actually go in and do their final install um, and transform their home. Okay. And then we bring them back to do the big reveal. So, and the, right the, the, so from the standpoint of the global experience, it's it it seemed to me that it was the process is very similar to the local. You're just yes. you're just announcing that I will do it globally. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you just put the calling card out, basically, mm -hmm. is what you're saying, and you're you're letting it be an SEO thing for your website. You're letting the potential client know that if they find you and like you, they don't have to wonder, will you go to the Bahamas and do mm -hmm. it? Yes, I will. Okay. So it's really it's 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 not a different service is what I'm, I'm i'm understanding it's just literally labeling it so that people can come to you for it exactly i yes. love it i yes. love it okay i love it i think it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> okay so now let's talk about it's i can understand how and why you transitioned into um, coaching interior designers. And I mean, just in the course of this half hour conversation, it's completely clear. You're completely capable of it because what I'm hearing is, is that you've analyzed every step of the way of what you've done. You're able to express it. You're able to understand the processes of it. And so what you did now, just recently in the beginning of 2017, is you've now quantified this and put it together in a coaching service for other designers and decorators, yes. right? And called it, you have, a, it's called Duarte Consulting. Yes. So within this, what I noticed is that you also came up with an eight, the eight uh, key steps to building a profitable interior design business. Yes. Awesome. So I love it. So Thank let's you. walk through the eight steps. What the first one is self and client discovery. Talk to us about that for a few seconds. Yeah. So this is so important because, you know, it, and this is like marketing 101. I remember, you know, working in advertising and the first thing that the conversation that we would have, and I'm talking about, you know, being in a room, a boardroom full of, you know, marketing executives that are very high level. And the first question that I would always ask was, Who's your customer? Mm -hmm. Who are we selling to? Because if you skip that, everything else, nothing else matters. Right, right. <laughs> it's the you're truth. Do everything else wrong, right? You're not going to have the right conversation with the right person. Your marketing is going to be off. It's going to be wrong. So, self discovery and client discovery in our industry is is just as important. Because first, I always I teach interior designers that you got to know who you are. You have to know, and when I say that, you know, it sounds cliche, but what I mean is you have to know what you bring to the table. Right. What your you is, Fred Burns. What's your you? Is, what's your you? <laughs> we're all unique. Uh, and I'll give you an example. It's not, it's not coincidence. I know that it's, it's on purpose that most of my clients are professional working women. Right. Usually senior level executive or above, um, not married with no children. You speak their language. You get I them. I speak their language because that's me. Right. right. You get right. them. Yep. Get and they them. know you get them and they understand it. And the, the whole um, unspoken language moves the whole project and the conversation quicker, mm -hmm. faster, more efficiently because you're not constantly explaining yourselves to each other. Exactly. I so, I it. mean, of course, I've worked with families, and sure. couples, but the majority of my clients fall into that that category. And so I know that, and I know, you know, the uniqueness that I bring to the table. And I think it's important for interior designers to really, really get clear on who they are and what differentiates them. And so I actually teach them how to do, do an exercise of, you know, going back into their, their history and how they were brought up and what has influenced them to become the person that they are and what, and also what, like, what triggers them, what excites them. Because where, you know, that place that you're, you're, you know, the most happy in what you're doing is the place that you'll, you'll prosper. Right. Um, so, you know, for me, I love to travel because I'm a military child. I've traveled all my life. And so that's why I have the global experience. That's right. a service that I offer. Right. So that's something unique. Right. So I always teach, you know, designers to, to figure out who they are. And then I'll, obviously, once they get that clear, then the next step is, you know, figuring out who do you want to work with? Like, right. who are you going to resonate with? And that's the whole client discovery process. I love it. Okay. And then the next 
uh, step is branding and marketing, which we sort of talked about a little bit mm-hmm. about now once you, like you, in your case, discovered and understand that you love the travel and that's your, you understand cultures and you have a lot of experience with cultures. So you brand to that and you market to that. That's pretty cool. And then the third step is systems and processes. So when you coach into your designers, do you have a set of systems and processes that you share and advocate that they use? Or do you, is it more like you sit down and you figure out what they're using and help them be more efficient within the systems that they're employing? Yes. Option B. So, okay. <laughs> because okay. Every, every business is different, right? Okay. Um, and we all are going to do things a little differently. So what I do is I help them figure out and actually I teach them how to create processes in their business. And then I also um, recommend and teach them which, what systems to use and implement based on, you know, how they plan to market their business and grow their business. Okay. So for instance, you might have access and understanding of, you know, say four different software programs, whatever it is that you Mm -hmm. might suggest. But once you get to know this particular interior designer, you might say, you know what, I just feel like this one is going to serve you best, or this one is you're going to be more comfortable for you to do. Okay. I like that. I like that. Because I come from the tech world, you know, it's in my blood. Like I always have my ears and eyes to the industry <laughs> of technology, just, you know, specifically to Terry design now. And so, um, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming out, like, you know, 360, um, you know, degree, uh, you know, renderings and just, you know, just really cool stuff. So I'm always, you know, looking out to see what's next and, you know, sharing that with interior designers so that they can stay cutting edge in their business. Cause that's right. important. But what I'm hearing is you take into account the individual interior designers yeah. level of ability and techness and all of that stuff so Absolutely. that you're not like just saying, okay, drill charge and use this program. Yeah. You're like, okay, this one will work for you. And they'll just make it better than what you're doing already. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also train how to use the systems because mm-hmm. that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because not everybody is at the same level of tech using technology. So um, some of the things that I do is I'll, you know, for example, if I recommend a CRM program, which I typically do, um, I'll actually do a, a webinar presentation or, you know, a walkthrough demo to actually teach them how to use it and how to set it up for their business. That's good. That's good. Yeah, you'd have to do that if you were going to recommend anything like that to me, because otherwise I'm just going to have the darn thing. It's going to sit there and I'm never going to open it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, Even if it's completely easy and it literally, it, you know, a four-year-old could do it until you sit down with me and make me do it. I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> it's, okay. a, it's a saying that say that says, you know, confused people do absolutely nothing. Yes, that's that's Definitely. what happens. It's like, oh, I, or what's ni- what's nice for me is I have Kimberly and Adriana. I'm like, you guys figure right. it out and then teach it to me. <laughs> so, and then your number four is packaging and pricing. So you have a conversation with them with things like what is their package? Like yours is the global experience and what could theirs be? Is that what you mean? And then how to price these different things? Yes, it's, it's interesting because a lot of designers have the question of how do they they how do they package their services Mm. like a lot of times they don't even know where to start right and so we talk a lot I teach that and you know how to actually create a package I actually just did a a master class on this on because it's so powerful like the way you present your services and your business means everything it means it's it's the it's it is you know the equivalent of if someone's going to buy from you and, and work with you or not right all about your presentation and so packaging is important and so I teach how to actually look at what you offer, what you have to offer that's unique because we know it's unique and what's the best way to present that to your, to your audience. Um, and then we look at, okay, now that you know what your services are and what you have to bring to the table, you know, and how to package it, what's the price point, you know? And, and that also goes back into the work that you, we've done previously of, understanding who your, your, who your target is. market is, right? Yeah. Because depending because you, on where you price mm-hmm. it is where you're going to attract. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. exactly. No. So it all works together. No, I love it. I mean, and I think that, you know, do you, do you know, Veronica Solomon? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, I always use her as an example because I, she, one of the first design, not that she was the first designer to do it. She was just one of the first designers that I came across that really, when I met her and I was preparing to interview for her, um, interview her, I saw all the different ways on her website that she packaged 
things for for uh, you know potential clients. And I just thought that it was so awesome. And the thing is that it's not for everybody, like you said. Talk, figure out your target market and la la la. But what I loved about it was when I thought about it as a consumer, it was like oh. Oh, you mean I can have a professional interior designer just come and help me do paint colors and I could just click on that button and I can set that appointment up and I can just pay for it and this can happen like I can this can be off my to-do list today. Right. I I thought that was genius. And yeah. you know what's going to happen? You're going to get it Veronica's going to walk in your house. You're going to love the death out of her. I mean, let's be real. And then your next thing you know, you're probably redesigning your whole darn room. Right. <laughs> that's how it happens. <laughs> exactly. So, I think that's great, but I do understand that it's challenging to figure out how to do it. And so that's really awesome that you include that in your coaching steps that you take the time to figure out if it's a right fit for that design firm and if it is how do they go about putting it together and pricing it so that's terrific and then I love the next one the business and legal forms number six step six right mm -hmm. have to have those set up and then what do you do there Monique do you have um uh, what's the word I want set forms like um you know what's the word I want you know what I mean like pre-made forms that you share with them that they can use or do you suggest that they work with a lawyer and set up their own firms how do you work that out when you're coaching yeah so I always like to provide examples right because mm -hmm. I feel like if you have an example you can take that example and then make it and shape it for you, you. Know, into what you need right okay so I, I provide examples and then I'll I also help them dissect their business and say okay what are the things that, you know, what are the types of forms that you need? Because there's a lot of different contracts mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. that interior designers can use. Um, but what do you need for specifically for your business? So we take a look at that and then, you know, I help them with shaping. And then I say, you know, you, obviously I recommend that they, you know, work with a lawyer just to make sure that the terms and everything that they need to cover them um, is included. Okay, right. So it's the whole, you know, I, I play a doctor on TV, but I'm not a real doctor. You help them right. all the way through it, but then you give them advice that they should sit down with their lawyer to just Absolutely. go through it and, and acknowledge and make sure that they're all, you know, kosher. Okay. I like that. And then your number six key is sourcing and selling. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. us about that one. So sourcing and selling, you know, a lot of times, um, designers have questions about, you know, what are the top, you know, vendors that I should be, you know, considering when I'm putting together a design uh, plan or, or, you know, how do I actually sell, how do I mark up my products? You know, what's the rate or how do okay. I, you know, how do I, um, you know, I have a lot of designers who have retail stores and, you know, they they have a lot of questions about, you know, how, what's, how do they buy and they sell and what's the price points that they should be selling at. So it's really about looking at, their entire process and, you know, what type of clients they're servicing and, you know, what their margin should be, you know, what their financial goals are. It's, it's a very, um, complex. <laughs> yes. That steps a sticky one, right? Yeah. It's a very complex. Um, but it's, it's like at the crux of your business, <laughs> right? Because if you don't under, sell at the right. right profit margin, you're really not a business. You're a hobby yeah. that's costing you money. <laughs> yeah. And it's very, it's become very complex because, you know, with the internet and, mm. you know, other companies like your Wayfarers of the world and, you know, all of these companies who now are offering, you know, designer furniture and they're selling it online and consumers can buy it. Free shipping so, and, you know, shipping. the first kid can go to college for a year and everything else. It's crazy, right? <laughs> Amazon now is, you know, going to be selling furniture. Like it's just. Who is now? I missed that. Amazon. Oh, for crying it, out yeah, loud. I it, hadn't heard it, that yet. Yeah, that's supposed to be in the works. Um, so how do you how do you navigate that? You know, and how do you make sure that, you know, as the margins continue to go down, that, you know, you still have a structured business that is profitable and that you can, you know, run a profitable business. And it really comes down to, you know, building relationships with vendors that sell only to the trade and making sure that, you know, you have those relationships in place and you have those accounts in place and you know, your product, you know, you know, I'll give you an example. I just uh, started a, pro a project uh, this week and, you know, I went into the home, we did the consultation and then, and my client says, okay, so do you know, you know, do you know, you have some ideas already? I said, yeah, absolutely. I already know the vendors that I'm going to be uh, working with to, to, you know, source your furniture. 
because I know the product. I know the look that she's going for. I know the style that she, the look and feel that she's going for. And I knew immediately who I would be working with. Right. Because you're right. Cause you really have a, a deep knowledge of what your, what's at your disposal. Exactly. So, so it's funny true. that you mentioned, um, the, you know, trade only sources. I just had a conversation a week or so ago with a designer that here in New Jersey that I do are window treatments. And she said to me, she said, you know, this woman is driving me crazy. She said, because every single time I spend time with her and come up with an idea and come up with a layout and make suggestions on furniture and this and that and the other thing, she said, I include everything so that we can just pull the trigger in and place the orders and stuff. And she always says, well, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to let you know and this and that. And she goes, and then never fails. Two, three, four days later, I get this email with all this list of, I found something that looks just like that here I, at this, at you know, at Wayfair or this or that. And it's this much cheaper and it's that much cheaper. And I'm just going to like place the order for these things. Right. <laughs> and, and of course, not very seasoned, obviously, right. right? This, this designer, but the thing is that is what happens to an unseasoned designer. And so what do you, what would you have said to her if she was expressing that frustration? And cause she said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've been working with her for so many months and I, I'm nothing, no project ever gets off the ground. It either this always follows up with a list of things that she can get that look just like what I suggested or, you know, a whole litany of stuff from Pinterest or, or house or something else that, you know, is, this looks like what you said. Can I just order this? Right. What do you, what do you say to her, Monique? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I get that all the time and it is a direct reflection on, um, not setting the expectation right, right. of how you work. Okay. You know, the first conversation that I have with clients is how I work. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, a dic dictatorship conversation. It's just, this is how I work. And I also ask them, how do they want to work with me? Mm -hmm. Because it's important to know if you have that type of client. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? right. So but what you're saying is, do you, you establish, do you say first how you work or do you say, what is your expectation of how this will work? And then you find out that they're that crazy kind of client and you say, well, this is how I do it and see right. if they still go for it or no. No. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's either we're going to work the way that I work and this is my process. This is how we work. Or I'd be happy to refer you to another design. Right, 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 right. right. Because that eliminates what you just, what we just talked about. Yeah, it's horrible. I, yeah, I mean, my, I was practically crying for her. I was in the car driving in Manhattan and we were on the phone and I'm just thinking to myself, oh my goodness, you need to listen to the podcast and all your smart <laughs> friends like that tell you how to get out of this situation, you know? Yeah. I mean, it breaks your heart. Uh, it's just crazy. But so, the, but that's the thing. It's setting the expectation up front. Cause you know, and the thing is, I don't know if that falls on deaf, deaf ears or not. I feel like it sometimes does. And what what I, a lot of times I say is, you know, when you go to a restaurant, it's very clear that you can't bring your own food into that right. restaurant. <laughs> like you would never like walk into a restaurant and be like, well, I'm going to order this and he's going to order that. But I brought three hot dogs for my kids. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah. it's, and I'll tell you where it stems from. It just stems from fear. Insecurity. It's, right. It's insecurity and fear of losing the client. Right. And one But of you're not making that, any money on the client anyway. So exactly. let them go. <laughs> and then your life is, is you know, a nightmare for yes. the, what, six months to whatever, you know, however long you're working with this client. Um, so that is a direct reflection of mindset. And that's something that um, it's not on my website, but it's something that we, I, I actually coach on. And I talk a lot about in our private Facebook group, because when you're an emerging designer, you know, it's really important. Obviously, once you've built your process and you've built how, you know, and you know, and you're crystal clear on how you want to work with your clients, that you stick to it. And the only way you can stick to it is if you have a very um, strong mindset and knowing that you only want to work with the clients that are right for you. And that if a client comes along and they're not the right client for you, it's okay to let it go. Right. Because another one's going to come along. Right. And that, and that takes time for sometimes for designers to, you know, get, because at the beginning you're like, I just wanted, you know, I want any client that I can get. Right. Right. <laughs> um, right. Right. It's, it's, it's yeah, nobody pretends that it's easy. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Nobody that's, you know, ahead of you on the curve of business experience, you know, you're not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that it's 
easy to stand in your space and walk away or to put a halt to something like that or to even express it from the beginning that this is the only way that you'll work. But what we're saying is, and what Monique is saying is, is you're going to get there eventually because you're going to have spun your wheels. You're going to been unpaid. You're going to spend, whether it's God forbid, six months or six years not making money. And then you're finally going to go, oh, that's what Monique said to do. Maybe I'll try it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I just, for me, I'm the kind of person that if somebody is an expert at something and they've had success at something and it's not my wheelhouse, if you tell me to do it, I not that I'm not going to evaluate, not that I'm not going to read and understand all the parameters and all the suggestions and all the different ways that, because I'm a questioner by nature. I've got to first figure out if I can prove it wrong. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's not even coming to proving it wrong. That sounds competitive. It's more, it's really what it is. I have to prove to myself okay. that you're right. right. That's for me what it is. It's like, hmm. But mm -hmm. once that happens, I will just literally within reason, do anything that you suggest that I do, because I have now proven to myself that you are a valid expert. You understand this. You've been through what I've been through and you've come through successfully. But I just, the number of times I had a, another conversation with another designer about two weeks ago, an assistant for a designer, and she was lamenting that something was going south on a job. And I just said, well, what about, you know, la la la? Why didn't you? Oh no, that would never work for us. And I, my brain freezes right there. Like, I'm just like, oh, okay. You're yeah. the only designer on the planet that that won't work for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have to be ready. You know? That's I, what it is. It's <laughs> it, They have to be ready for it. It's so true. And that, you know, it's funny that you say that, Mooney, because I literally walked away from that conversation. I thought, she's really just really rather cling to the problem right now. That's really what I said to myself. She really isn't ready for the solution to the problem. I'm like, oh, it's unfortunate. You know what I mean? So, but, you know, I, I agree with you that that um, it is setting it up at the beginning, the conversation, the parameters, and establishing your worth, establish, establishing that you are bringing value to this process. So yeah. that's terrific. And then we go to number seven key is recognition and connection. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that yeah. one. So this one's important. I think this is one that, you know, as designers, we forget about, you know, we forget that, okay, you know, we have, you know, we're doing really great work and we want we should share it with people. We should share, you know, what we're doing. And so this is powerful because it also helps you grow your business. So this is all about, you know, how to network, you know, what are the right events to go to? Um, I'll give you a story, a really quick, tell you a quick story. A friend of mine, um, you know, came to me and she was actually in, uh, in the coaching program. And she said, you know, I really want to, you know, I want to get really high in clients. And I said, okay, well, how are, you know, what are you doing now to get high end clients? What are you doing? Where are you going? She says, well, you know, um, I don't really go out too much. I don't really go to events and things like that. And I said, well, have you ever heard the saying that, you know, people who make a certain income, let's just say, you know, $30,000 a year. Right. And that's, you know, it, I'm not, you know, saying that that's a, a low income. I'm just saying just an example, You're just picking someone, a number. Yeah. If someone makes $30,000 a year, right. It's, the fact, it's a fact that they probably hang out with people who make $30,000 a year, mm -hmm. right? right? So if your goal is to get clients that, you know, make, let's just say over, you know, $200,000 a year, then you need to be in the place where people who are making that amount of money are, you know, you, you need to be in that vicinity, you need to be along, alongside with them. Right. And I said, this is what I suggest that you do. I said, get dressed up. <laughs> Put said, your big girl clothes on. Put your big girl clothes on, <laughs> Get right? those high heels big, out of the closet. Right, the high heels, the nice jewelry, whatever you have in your closet. And I said, go to a charity event. Mm. I said, because what's the one place that people who have a lot of money, where are they usually? They're usually actually giving it back. They're giving they're it paying away. Paying it for yeah. it. Yeah. I said, and they're usually doing it at a charity event. I said, just go. I said, Ch you know, choose one that you're, you know, maybe you're passionate about. Um, and she went. I'm going to just fast forward. And she said, she came back and she said, oh my God, you won't believe what happened. She said, I met this lady and she was sitting at the same table as the lady, didn't know the lady. And, you know, they just got in conversation and the lady asked her what she did for a living. She said, I'm an interior designer. And she said, oh, you know, I, um, I've been meaning to redo my, get my window treatments done, you know, get window treatments done for my home. Um, it's been a long time. And she said, they exchanged cards and, uh, they called, she called her 
she went in, she did her rendo treatments and the lady loved her work so much that a month later she called her and said, you know what? You did such an amazing job on those window treatments. You know, um, there's actually, it's actually starting to make the rest of my house look dull. <laughs> so I Home run. Sit up a bit and yeah, do some decorating. Could you help me? Long story short, that conversation by her going to that charity event turned into almost a $500,000 project. Whoa. Isn't that something? So that's the power of connection mm -hmm. and networking. Because when you're networking with the right people, your clientele, right? And even, even, even networking, I, I always recommend, you know, becoming a, a member of organizations in the interior design industry. Because I can't tell you how many times I've referred a client to another interior designer, either because I'm booked or, you know, maybe it's just not the right fit, you know, and I have someone else who I know who could do an amazing job on it. Right. So you connection and people and building relationships is like so, so powerful and it's so important and there's an art to it. So, you know, I teach how to, how to do that, where to go, you know, what are the organizations you need to be a part of? And then also, you know, what trade shows to attend? Because when you have education and you know exactly, okay, what's coming up, what's the new trends and you're around, you know, people in your industry, you know, it just, it just, it just helps you grow your business and have resources at your fingertips. So it's, it's really important to network. I teach, you know, trade shows. I also teach, um, you know, what uh, contest to submit your work to, because wow. remember we're in a visual industry. Mm -hmm. So you could have all, you know, all these amazing projects that you've done, that you've spent money, you know, uh, taking, you know, photos of, but if no one sees it, right. <laughs> no one knows point? you exist. Right. So, point? you know, I also, um, you know, share and I teach, you know, what are the different contests that are going on and, you know, Sherwin Williams and all the big companies, they always have, you know, interior design contests and things like that where you can submit your work. So I think it's a, it's a big afterthought, um, but it's a, it's a marketing tool, but it's also, you know, just a way to, to grow your business. And it's super important. I love it. I love it because in this age of, you know, social media and everything being digital, there is a lot to be said for mm -hmm. being present at the different events and whether the event is a networking trade event or like you said, uh, a charity event where you have an opportunity to make relationships with the people that who could potentially be your clients. I mean, that happened to be a very, very fast turnaround to so go to one event and meet one really five, you know, $500,000 client. Awesome. <laughs> right. But the truth is, it might be that, like you said, to pick maybe possibly a charity that you have some emotion and passion attached to. And what happens is you might go to one event and not meet any, but any new client. But if you become involved in that, that charity, and now you are swimming with the sharks who are at that level, the women and the men who give their money and their time to events like that are usually of the you know, higher disposable income and, you know, you, you make friends and mm -hmm. then you become somebody that they refer, even if they don't need you. So, and I also love that what you said is because we always talk about how every client isn't always going to be a right fit for you. And we joke and we, you know, we, you know, we do things here where we like, you know, pretend that it's because they're crazy, but it's really just because their personality doesn't mesh with yours. There right. is somebody for everybody. And if this were a podcast that went, you know, out to the consumer, we'd, we'd cut it, cut it back a little bit with the joking around about it. But the reality is, is that I absolutely know that somebody's crazy pants client is somebody else's dream client. Exactly. That's, I mean, it's just the truth, you know? Exactly. So yeah. it really, it's a, it's, it's a joke, but it's not really intended or meant to be disparaging because we all have, I mean, uh, look, I'm tough. You're, I'm tough to sell to. I know I am. But when that right salesperson, you know, I connect with that salesperson is, that's great. But, um, you know, so I know it's, it's, you know, somebody, Somebody else would say I'm crazy lunatic and somebody else would say she's awesome. So keep the ones away. Our gifts, you know, the gift that you have and the uniqueness. For example, you know, there's an interior designer who's a good friend of mine and she specializes in feng shui design. Mm. Now, you know, that's not my thing. Right, 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 <laughs> so right. If I had a client who came to me and said, okay, I need help with, you know, feng shuiing my home. 
I would immediately refer them to her, you know, right. or someone else because she's not that she's a bad client or I'm, you know, uh, you know, right. it's, it's just not your skill set. Right. Yeah. I mean, somebody could want a kitchen done and maybe that's not your skill set. Mm-hmm. And so, but by being active in the different organizations and the different trade um, scenarios and so forth, and you meet your colleagues then you have an opportunity to refer to and be referred by. So I think it's awesome. And then the last one is finances and income streams. So of course, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. you got to lock that down. <laughs> so, yeah. This is the one that, you know, to be honest, like it was the one that I struggle with the most. Mm. And I'll tell you why, because, you know, coming from working in the corporate space for so long, I had an employee mentality. You know, Mm. I was used to, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, you know, getting paid, paying my bills and maybe trying to save a little bit here and there and, you know, doing it all over again every month. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times as designers, you know, we take, we come into this industry with that same mindset. And so what I learned, uh, over <laughs> the, probably say the first two years is when it took me uh, probably about the first three years, it took me that long to grasp the science of building a business and managing finances in our industry. Because as you know, you know, there's no set pay schedule. You know, you right. might have one client or one project today and you might not have another one for a couple months. Right. Um, so you have to really get good at cash flow. So in managing and budgeting your business, you know, understanding what you're and setting goals in your business so that you can, you know, really um, manage your cash flow. And so that's what I that's what I, I teach. I teach, you know, how do you maximize your revenue? You know, how much do you ask for? How do you, you know, uh, price your services. And then how do you make that, that, you know, that income that you make, how do you make that, you know, last (laughs) and, you know, cover your expenses? Like how do you budget your business? So great lessons, great lessons, because, you know, we, you think about a more mature firm and we, we, what I often talk about and, and lament about is the robbing Peter to pay Paul. And that's the Achilles heel a lot of times of a more established firm because there is cash flow, but they're not managing it properly. But there's always something there. So they're taking deposits on one project and paying balance dues on another project and maybe not necessarily, you know, keeping things, you know, straight. But that's a whole nother um, problem separate from an absolute out the gate firm that there's a a project now in April, but maybe I don't have anything in the pipeline. And what if there's no other, another project doesn't come until August, how do I manage and run the business through to that? So that's a different, particularly different challenge. So I, I'm glad that you address that in your coaching with designers. That's uh, pretty terrific because that's, that's, that's key. You got to get, you got to get to it. <laughs> you yeah. know? And I'll tell you, I read a book that literally changed my whole business mm. from the, from a financial perspective, it's called profit first. Oh, gee. <laughs> Whoa. I, you don't know what's so funny. Do you, uh-huh. you know, what's so funny is I literally, I told you when we started this conversation that I finished an interview four or five minutes before you and I started, yes. it's a power talk Friday on, on profit first. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. I know. I love profit first too. I think it's, it's amazing. And it turns out that we have one of our own in the industry, Michelle Williams from the Scarlet Thread Consulting, who is a, a certified profit first coach. So wow. tell us, go ahead. You you say hey, somebody, you know, I'm not sure where these shows are going to air before or after each other. <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. Isn't so, it great? It's awesome. I mean, it changed my whole perspective in the way that I was running my business because again, I was coming from an employee, you know, mindset and profit first, it, it flips that mindset on its head yes. and it, you know, teaches you to pay yourself first. And most importantly, which I mean, when I tell you it was like night and day, of, you know, managing my, my business and just having, you know, fluid income coming in and being able to manage it properly was when I learned, and I learned this, you know, from reading the book is when I learned how to actually sort my money, sort the income that I have and create separate accounts for the different things that I was managing. Because what happens is when your money is all in one account, you know, and you're paying, you know, you're buying furniture, you're doing this, you're paying expenses, you know, 
it's it's very hard to manage. It's almost impossible. Right. If you ask me. <laughs> right. Right. No, um, it, it really can be very, very difficult. And it's an amazing approach. I. I, I just, what's funny for me is that I listened, I came across uh, Profit First on the Biz Chicks podcast. Mm -hmm. And what hit me was how a lot of what he discussed, we were already doing in Window Works. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, and what I said in the Power Talk Friday conversation is that I love the way it, it, it takes a complex system of running a business and the finances of that business. And literally to me, when I heard it, it was like, oh, that's what we do. But that's so much easier to explain it that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so I thought it was terrific. I love it. I love it a lot. I mean, I'm so glad that you are using it and you're a proponent of it because that makes me so glad that I reached out to have her on the show. So I'll have to run your two shows next to each other. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, I'm going to tell you what, Monique, I am so glad that we connected through Facebook and that you were on the show. You really are very you know, particularly brilliant business person. I'm very impressed. Um, tell everybody if they are interested in, is, are, it, you said it's a private group. Is it a group that you're looking for new members to or like, don't even bring it up, Luann. I, I don't want any more. What's the deal with that? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's open for, you know, all interior designers and decorators. Um, it's just private because, you know, obviously we want to, uh, you know, keep it, um, keep the integrity of the group and, you know, really, um, protect it so that it's, it truly a serves a safe place. Yes. Right, it serves our, our, um, our members. So and, if a tier, interior designer is listening, would love to be a part of the group, they can ask to join and then you'll just double check and vet yep. to make sure they're actually a real interior designer. I'm exactly. Making and that's a, yeah. That's, a, that's the only uh, prerequisite. Yeah. If you're an interior, you're practicing interior designer. Yep. And how do they find it? How do they find the group and how do they find you, Monique? Yeah, so they can actually go to, um, they can type in um, Interior Designer's Guide to Profitability in the search box on, on Facebook, and it'll come right up, Great. and you'll be able to request to, to join. Terrific. And then your consulting is, is it DuarteConsulting.com? I'm looking all over my notes for it. I'm not finding yeah. it. It's DuarteConsulting.net. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And they can actually join the group that way as well. Um, they can sign up on, on our website. And they can also learn more about, uh, you know, uh, our services and our coaching programs. Um, we have quite a few things for, depending on what level uh, an interior designer is, uh, we actually have a master class, which is phenomenal. And what it is, is it's a two day master class. It's all done online. So you can, you know, you can take the class in the comfort of your own home and it teaches you everything. It's like the blueprint to building a profitable interior design business. I love it. So it's everything they need to know. Um, it's over 10 hours of content that I basically just, uh, poured into, <laughs> poured into designers. And, um, now we have it available on demand. So anyone can sign up for it and um, watch it whenever they, whenever they're free. Okay. And that's all accessible through DuarteConsulting.net. Duarte okay. Yes. And it's D-U-A-R-T-E consulting.net. Yes, that's correct. I love it. I love it so much. I really, um, I, I said to you a moment ago, I'm so glad that you reached out. I, I'm so impressed by you. I think what I love is, you know what it is, is, and I, I don't know, I say this often enough on the show, but a lot of people are very good at what they do and some are better than others expressing what and how they do. And you're one of the ones who are better at it. And I appreciate that and value that. And I thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. This is, this is awesome. And I, I love the work that you're doing, you know, through your podcast. I think that, you know, education and um, providing people with information is so powerful. And so um, I want to just thank you for, you know, creating this platform. For oh, you're us. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a great day, Monique. Thank you so much. You too. My great thanks to the featured sponsor of our podcast, Kravit Inc., 
of all the terrific things about Kravit. Do you know about curatedkravit.com? I know you've heard me tell you all about it for this last year and a half, but have you taken a minute to really go and look and check out curatedkravit.com yet? You have to see this collection of the most unique, high-quality finished products for the home. The collection includes furniture, lighting, bedding, rugs, accessories, and more. It is so comprehensive. It features customized designs as well as unique hand-picked pieces from the global design market. CuratedKravit.com is available exclusively to the trade. That's right. No direct consumer purchasing. They have your back at Kravit Inc. And have you checked out the innovative ready-to-ship upholstery program? This is groundbreaking in our industry. Where else can you find someone that delivers custom quality furniture fast? I'll tell you where else. Nowhere else. You see, it's the combination, custom quality and fast. That is at curatedkravit.com. You can shop the site by product category, by stylized product stories, and through the curated rooms designed by the industry tastemakers. At curatedkravit.com, they are committed to making your job more efficient by providing unmatched customer service coupled with an exceptional product offering. Kravit Inc. stands firm in their mission to serve the interior design trade at the very highest level. And the last and one of the most fabulous features is the process is so simple. That's right. Design, click, deliver. Easy as that. One last thing. Kravit Inc. has a thank you to you as a listener of the podcast. If you are on the site and you are ready to make a purchase, any one purchase, you can get 10% off as their thanks to you. Enter the code CKPODCAST at checkout for 10% off any one purchase. Well, I do thank them very much, and I really do hope that you will take a moment to see how curatedkravit.com can help you run your business more efficiently. So I really liked Monique's eight steps to running a profitable interior design firm. You know, it's not rocket science, right? It's, you know, we've talked about most of these steps at some point or another in this last year, but it's sort of nice to have that list right in front of you and to check it off and evaluate it. Are you a getting each of these done. So um, keep in mind that Monique has a lot of information available to you as interior designers on her consulting website, which is www.duart.com consulting.net. It's D-U-A-R-T-E consulting.net. She has online classes for designers. And of course, she has that free PDF of those eight steps that you can download. Now, here are some of my takeaways from the conversation with Monique. First is she does exactly what Fred Burns teaches us to do. She expresses the things that make her different from other designers, her you, right? Fred talks about what is your you, She was raised as an army kid and she traveled the world and she puts this all over her marketing. She talks about the global influences in her design and her, in her coaching business, she includes the marketing information about her previous career in marketing and direct marketing. And, um, she explains how and why that makes her different from other business coaches. So I'm just saying high five Monique for getting all that in there. Then how about finding that first interior design mentor? I love how she did it. I mean, here it is. She simply asked him. (laughs) That's genius, right? Now, she was lucky. She obviously found, just by chance, a very giving and talented mentor. So I realize you can't know if the one you ask will say yes or if he or she will really be a gracious mentor. But the lesson is twofold. If you need a ma- and if you need a mentor, maybe just reach out and ask someone you have something in common with. If you are um, in a place in your career and you've crossed paths a couple of times, and maybe you could ask them if you could get together or could get together through Skype or whatever it may be. And then don't forget about the other side, which is if you are asked to be somebody's mentor. And I know we're all very busy, but you know, figure out a way that the parameters could work. And of course, that's the third part of it is setting up the parameters, the agreement, so that neither side feels uh, uncomfortable, right? And I, and that's how you set up a really great situation. So I love that she did that for herself. And then I also love that Monique mentioned the book Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. 
This is a great framework for running your business. And this week on Power Talk Friday, Michelle Williams is back from the Scarlet Thread Consulting to explain all about the Profit First system. You'll hear me on that show tell Michelle how when I first heard about Profit First, I was listening to the Biz Chicks podcast and Mike was being interviewed by Natalie. And I was so present, pleasantly surprised to realize that without having a name for it, that we were already employing many of these profit principles at Window Works. So I can tell you that he makes a lot of sense and Michelle is a certified Profit First coach and that's a great episode so awesome that Monique has set her business up that way too Alrighty, so thanks so much for joining me. Remember how much I value and appreciate your iTunes reviews and if you have personally not left me one yet would you possibly think about doing that I would be very 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 appreciative um, so that is it for today thank you tons for joining me have an excellent day Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events. Music